How are you? This is Dr. Rob Cannonello from uh, New York. Uh, we're, this is our next edition of RPM2, where fitness is medicine. Um, so today we got myself up here in the New York area. Down below and south, we got uh, Dr. Matt Word in Florida. Um, in the central area, we got Dr. Michael Chin in Illinois. Up a little bit more of the, the great north, northern area. And I'm not, I'm not really northwest, but central north is Dr. Paul Langer in Minnesota. And then we got to bring all the way from the other side our special guest, uh, Dr. Doug Ritchie from California. So we are covering the country today, and um, it's really great to have everyone back together because we've had a little bit of a, a time lapse. Um, everyone's been busy, but we're back at it, and here we are today. Um, so welcome, guys. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So um, like we said, today we have our special guest. It's uh, Dr. Doug Ritchie from Shield Beach, California. Um, Dr. Doug Ritchie is an individual that is very important to everyone on this uh, podcast live mm -hmm. in sports medicine. Um, a little bit of background about him right now. He is the adjunct uh, associate professor at Applied Biomechanics at the California College of uh, Podiatric Medicine in Oakland, California. He's a fellow and past president of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine of course, he's a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, author of numerous peer-reviewed literature and texts that we've all have read. Um, he's an inventor. He's an innovator. He holds multiple patents, including um, the Ritchie Brace, which we all know and have used <laughs> quite often. Um, and currently, he has is an author of Pathomechanics, Pathomechanics of Common Foot Disorders that's available through Springer, which is a great text for um, young and old docs um, to understand a little bit more about uh, where we're coming from. Um, and, you know, Dr. Richie, welcome. It's so good to have you here because um, personally, it is you who brought me into this sports medicine world. And I thank you for that. Actually, you and Dr. Word together. So to have both of you guys here, um, you saw something in me. I don't know what it was, but uh, I appreciate you having it. So welcome, Doc. Well, it's my pleasure. It's a pleasure to be together with all you guys again. It's been a while and I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas and uh, tales of, of misadventures in the past or whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. Let's, let's start from there. Yeah, we'll, we'll start off right from there because, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions in the sports medicine world and a lot of like things that we were taught maybe 30 years ago. Dr. Ritchie, I think you've been out now for 38 years, I guess. Yes. Um, and currently retired that's why he looks so damn good um uh, but you know after doing this for so many years there's a lot of things that uh, we've always talked about said this we like to go back to time and say sorry to some of our patients uh because there's things that maybe we wouldn't do today that we do now but i think some of the things still continue on though and the, some of the the teachings and um uh protocols that we still see young doctors performing are still out there are there some things and some misconceptions and some myths that you think that you would like to touch on today, Doc? Well, I think the one issue that's been dear to my heart is just the whole concept of managing an ankle sprain. I think that's a great way to start because it, there is still a mindset in this country among both medical and lay people that it's just a sprain. And there's still a a mindset to put an, an athlete, particularly a young athlete, back to play way before they've properly recovered. They've restored uh, stability to the damaged ligaments and restored proprioception and neuromuscular control. And we're just now learning the devastating consequences of that. Uh, there's some really good papers now, uh, you know, looking at athletes 30 years later who had suffered what we would all consider a minor ankle sprain who go on and develop post-traumatic osteoarthritis. And as you all know, there's not a lot of good treatment options for that. And when it happens to a 40 year old, uh, they either face an effusion of their ankle or an ankle joint replacement, which has guarded prognosis, particularly for a, an at, active athlete. And so they're kind of done, you know, their career's over and they might be doomed to take an anti-inflammatories the rest of their life. From one mismanaged injury, that continues today to be looked at some all too often as it's just a sprain. So let's talk ourselves through that. Say we have a, say an 18 year old, I don't know, punter from Lakeland, Florida, 
and you know he Don't say that. his ankle. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be your protocol now for this young eighteen-year-old who has this issue from 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 when we first see them? Well, we know you know ligaments. Here's another part of this whole myth: is there's an, a a perception that ankle ligaments heal differently than knee ligaments or elbow ligaments, and um, a, a real a, a good analogy is the medial collateral ligament of the knee. Um, when when an athlete sprains that ligament, any trainer, any therapist, any physician would say you're going to be out three to four weeks. Okay, and by the way, it's not an operative indication for a medial collateral sprain of a knee. In the ankle, we think the date should go back three to four days. It's the same tissue, it's still collagen. It has to undergo the four stages of healing. And if you send them back before they're healed, you better protect them, at least with uh, external bracing, taping, whatever. But we, we don't think that that's really adequate. We have to restore stability but with normal healing of tissue and then augment it with proprioception and muscular uh, strengthening. The bottom line is an ankle sprain should be a one month recovery, just like a knee sprain. Absolutely. Dr. Word, you deal a lot with athletes uh, in your area. What should, would you say that protocol is kind of how you're, you, you look at things as well? Because yeah, you also got the pressure of the coaches and parents and, and just peer pressure to get back. So how does it work for you guys? Yeah, it's funny because when you mentioned an MCL, uh, when I was a junior in high school, I had a kind of a bad MCL injury. And four weeks later, I was back after a hematoma and recovery. But um, I, you know, I think you know, Doug's right on with speeding these eight, what a typical uh, ATF ankle sprain within a, within a week without really looking at the long-term picture on what that means. Um, you know, I, I work with professional and collegiate athletic trainers that certainly want to do the best for the athlete, but they're also pushed by the, the coaching staff and the school to try to get, uh, or get these, these patients back as soon as possible. And obviously the, the rehab and the protection is a big part of it. One thing, uh, Doug, if you, you can, a little bit of a, a red herring on just a, a typical ankle sprain, and I, I've seen this soccer and football players especially, uh, with more of a, a, a quote unquote high ankle sprain, anterior inferior tib tib ligament. And we've had a, a few of these that have actually had uh, uh, you know, tightrope type of procedures and getting them back within uh, within six weeks, which not uh, probably something that, that's recommended. I don't know if you have any thoughts on a treatment of a high ankle sprain and a, a competitive athlete and what the time frame or what your uh, criteria would be to, to put that patient back uh, into their sport. Yeah, that's a really good been point. A real challenge. Uh, that is a really good point. And I've participated in forums where we're showing this research about the fact that we really need to hold these athletes back until they're strong and stable. And people appropriately bring up, well, then why don't we just do a primary repair? Uh, or an augmentation with, the, you know, with, with some of these new technologies, like you mentioned. And it's hard to argue against that. I mean, for my whole career, it was thou shalt not operate on an ankle sprain, you know, let it heal naturally. There's no evidence that a primary repair, immediate repair gives a better result than conservative management. But now we're finding out our conservative management isn't all that great. Um, and for the reasons we just talked about, but Maybe if we jump in and do uh, a, a, an immediate repair and augment it, and I've seen videos of, of uh, NFL players coming back and playing two weeks later and doing cutting drills, and uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, you, you could stop and say, well, how's that guy going to do in 20 years? Well, I don't know, but uh, with a high ankle sprain is where they're getting more aggressive with that, as you said, Matt. Uh, particularly in hockey, we're seeing some of these guys – getting immediate repair of the syndesmosis and they're back playing. You know, one uh, person that came to mind because I've seen a number of these after is the Alabama quarterback Tua. Uh, when he was at Alabama, within two weeks, he had a high ankle sprain. I'm like, all right, he's done for the season. And then two weeks later, he's back playing. And he basically had a kind of a, a tightrope type of deal back playing at a highly competitive level. Um, yeah. 
And, yeah. and so we now we have a, a high school kid or a college kid that has the same injury as him and says, how come I can't get back like he did? Yeah. And that yeah, puts look. a little press, pressure on the provider to, to address those issues. Yep. And getting back to like those things that we all learned about those myths, you know, we all, and, and Dr. Langer and Dr. Chin, I'd like you to chime in on this as well, is that, you know, we always learned about, you know, rice, you know, uh, but, you know, I think nowadays we're, we're talking more about meat, you know, rice is nice, but right. meat is neat. And if people don't know what meat is, meat is movement, exercise, analgesics, and then moving on to treatment. Um, I think that's kind of where we're moving, kind of getting people out of those um, restricted casts and boots and trying to move them a little bit more. Is that what you guys do? Yeah, I'd say I'd say that's been the direction I've uh, been going probably for about five years or so. And and I think, you know, one of the things that kind of brought it to light, too, is even talking with guys like Howard Dannenberg and, you know, using joint manipulations, especially post immobilization, I think is extremely helpful. You know, I think if we look at maybe some of the causes of that osteoarthritic post injury change, it's because the ankle joints limited, just like if you had a first MTB joint that's been sprained, turf toe injury, and it's limited. So, you know, getting the range of motion, I think, is extremely helpful without, obviously, the stress of cutting moves and things like that. Uh, we do use, obviously, bracing, you know, that have more of a hinge approach, like the Ritchie brace. Um, I have some Axiom type stuff that we use as kind of temporary stuff at the beginning. But, you know, I use Shockwave. Obviously, I've been a big proponent of that. We've talked about that, obviously, in a number of our podcasts. I use also amniotic injections to kind of get that stimulus to go. Um, I haven't had to do a lot of lateral ankle, you know, uh, surgeries or stabilizations, um, and thankful, you know, that we haven't had to operate on those patients, but, but there are, I think instances where, you know, you got a professional athlete and they're going to need that kind of return to athletics at a, at a quicker pace. I think a lot of these minimally invasive approaches are starting to kind of offer that. So. I'll, I'll add kind of another little facet to that too, because you mentioned movement, Rob, um, I had a, um, a, a high school volleyball player just a couple of months ago who was being recruited by Division I programs. Her mother played Division I uh, basketball, or I should say volleyball. And she came in with some acute midfoot pain that, that acute enough where we didn't order an MRI right away because they didn't want the expense of it, but we had to boot her. Um, and a subsequent MRI a few months later when she wanted to get back on the court, I should say six weeks later, um, did show a bone stress injury of her uh, cuneiforms and her second metatarsal. And what turned out to be the problem was that her mother had prophylactically uh, taped and used ankle braces when she played Division I uh, volleyball back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And so she had her daughter using prophylactic ankle braces, and, and she's never had an ankle injury. And, and her brace, of course, is constricting right over where this bone stress injury and midfoot injury was. So I, it took some time to convince her that, that thoughts have changed on bracing, especially for uninjured athletes, and that you can't restrict motion of one joint without um, causing an effect on the adjacent joints. And, and it took her a while to kind of understand that, but she did come around and say, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess we don't need to be worrying about bracing, especially since we caused an injury that, that is kind of an unusual injury. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's good, but, but that's the hard part is communicating with the parents and sometimes the coaches that, that movement is good and that uh, some of the, the things we have to unlearn will help our, our athletes better. Absolutely. I don't know if you guys follow, but I, I'm an avid follower of Dr. Richie's blog at Podiatry Today, and I know you've touched on a lot of those things in the past, um, but one of the things that I'd like to ask you a little bit is something that Michael just touched on is assessing the evidence of these alternative type of procedures, you know, for these acute injuries that have become chronic, perhaps like shockwave, like perhaps low, laser, low level lasers and things like that. Um, where, do they, where do they fit in? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and, and I'll just share, you know, the recent experience, I just wrote that uh, feature article for Podiatry Day on new technologies for, there you go, plantar heel. Pain. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so what I want to, uh, I was given a word count, I don't know, of uh, 3,000 words. And so I, I actually found 10 new technologies for plantar heel pain that I wanted to review. And I used up, you know, 3,000 words on the very first technology, which was shockwave. And I kept running into laser, you know, in my 
literature review. And my, I'll be honest with you, I, I thought laser was just a sham. Uh, always thought so. And I started reading the literature and lo and behold, the evidence on laser is every bit as good as PRP and almost as good as shockwave from pretty credible sources and just as high quality of studies, not as many studies as we've seen on shockwave, but here's a, a case where I had a built-in um, opinion um, about a, a treatment that in lo and behold is something we should all look at. Uh, it's got great potential. And we're just learning about dosage, whether low level laser versus high energy laser is better. And, and kind of like shockwave, what are the protocols? Should they be, you know, should it be three sessions a week for 12 weeks or, you know, but I, the bottom line is we're still learning. And even, even at my old age, I had kind of an epiphany looking at that and realizing there's a lot of new technologies coming out and there's a lot of things that were, have been out that we haven't give, given credibility to that we should. Yeah, doc, Dr. Ivan Bristow in the UK, he shared a quote with me from an older doc. Um, and the quote was, those who cannot be cured by medicine can be cured by surgery. Those that cannot, that cannot be cured by surgery can be cured by heat. And those that cannot be cured by heat are considered to be incurable. That old doc, that's from Hippocrates. So, uh, you know, I think there's something to be said. I know Dr. Chin utilized a uh, laser quite a bit. Can you maybe ex express your experience with that? Yeah, I think uh, laser, so we have an MLS uh, class four laser and uh, it works basically in two different modalities. So it's got kind of low and high. So it kind of pulses, which is nice. Um, but I find it works really well in acute injuries. So that person who comes in the first week, say they roll their ankle on a Saturday, they roll in on a Monday and they're getting, you know, kind of the swelling pattern, kind of the same concept is, you know, get the swelling, you know, process down without adding something like ice in this case. So we do typically twice a week and we'll do somewhere between six to eight sessions. So it's, you know, three to four weeks. And as they're kind of going through, you know, that process, we also have them doing, you know, some light exercises, you know, not anything that's again, cutting moves, but at least keeping that mobility going. And maybe that's tied in with physical therapy. Um, some, if they're, you know, exquisitely painful, then obviously we do again, brace them. But again, I'm always assessing that ankle joint range of motion, the subtalar joint range of motion, see if there's that restriction. But laser, I've been using laser for probably close to 10 years, um, you know, different machines, different, you know, products. But MLS has been pretty solid. Um, and, you know, as an acute, like I wouldn't use necessarily shockwave in the acute scenario. I find that, you know, that would probably do better if you're looking at maybe two, three months down the road as they've kind of gone through those phases of healing. You're trying to break up scar tissue, you're trying to get that blood flow back into the tissue. But for the acute, I'd say laser has been probably our go-to. Yeah, you know, the one thing that I kind of see, and Michael and I talk about this a lot as well, is that we have someone that comes in with an ankle sprain, you know, most clinicians, the first thing they might do is to boot them, and they might boot them for a certain amount of time. Uh, I find that the booting in, in, in time will cause a whole new set of problems, mm -hmm. including an anterior displacement of that ankle. So, you know, a lot of times I'm actually mobilizing these individuals because you can actually hear a huge cavitation when you do it. That's because they're so um, they're, they're in a bad position when they're moving. Um, Dr. Ward, do you see that a lot when you're athletes, you know, if they're booted for a long time? You know, um, interesting you, you bring that up because one thing that changed my mindset was something I had the fortune of spending two years, I believe, on our AAPSM board with uh, Dr. Ritchie. And I still remember you show a slide of uh, typical post ankle sprain and ankles flop down with an ace wrap around it. I, I know you know what that slide is. And then the next <laughs> slide, you kind of show the anatomy. ATF ligament is stretched when the foot's down, patient's laying in bed or, or what have you. Um, it just, it makes complete sense anatomically. And I don't know why more people don't understand that, but basically putting uh, that patient in a boot does two things. One, feels better. Two, it, it, it locks and it uh, allows that ATF ligament to be in a healing position versus a, a stretched tension position. And weight bearing the patient in the boot um, has, has really uh, allowed, I think allowed quicker healing and 
I don't, I don't know if things have changed since then, Doug, but I, I still will boot an acute ankle sprain for that reason. And I actually have a patient sleep with the air cast or the, whatever your boot of choice is, uh, because uh, when that foot's down, when you're sleeping, uh, it's going to not heal as well. And the collagen fibers are not going to heal. Am I still right on that? Or was that just a one yeah. thing? That I yeah. I mean, with? that lecture and that you reviewed the key points uh, absolutely perfectly uh, is there's a period right after the ankle strain where we're trying to get dorsiflexion back into the ankle mortise. We're trying to get that talus up. And this is what the uh, therapists do with joint mobilization. And happily, we've now learned there's some good data. There's a recent study showing a failure to, uh, to achieve normal dorsiflexion back in the ankle is a number one risk factor for a repetitive sprain afterward. But, but I think what Rob was alluding to is at what point do we not immobilize? So we're gonna use a rigid immobilizing device to get that ankle up into 90 and keep it there at least for a few days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. But we also think there's a detriment to freezing the ankle too long, regardless of the position uh, because of adhesions and other problems. But I think if you're doing uh, mobilization right after you get them out of the boot, um, I think the boot's a good precursor to that. And, and we've seen this anecdotally, and now we've seen some good research. It, it's just very soothing to the athlete to have that foot held at 90 and, and, and get that mortise back. And like you said, reoppose the, uh, the ligaments anatomically. So I'm, I'm still in favor of booting, but we're now seeing so much evidence that mobilization is such a key factor in the overall rehabilitation. And like when I was in school, manipulation, mobilization, that was done by crackpot therapists and, and chiros. And we, of course, wouldn't uh, even consider any association with that science, you know, way back. And now we team up with these people and all credible physical therapists and chiros believe strongly and it's validated that mobilization and or manipulation are critical to the recovery of an ankle sprain. Yeah, I'll definitely take on that role as a crackpot right now. I, I'm enjoying it. Uh, and helping my patients. Um, I was lucky enough one time to give a lecture in front of a national group of physical therapists. I remember getting up there and saying, I never prescribe physical therapy. And they're like, oh, this guy's an idiot. And uh, I said, I only prescribe um, physical therapists, not physical therapy. So when you get your athlete to the physical therapist, is it immediate? Is it within the first three days? Is it a first couple of weeks? When would you get them to your, your physical therapist of choice? Yeah, that's always a, a, a great question. I, I don't think anybody has the, obviously in a professional setting, we're seeing these guys, you know, they're literally seeing their therapist, the athletic trainer, uh, um, two minutes after the injury. But in, a, in the community setting with a recreational athlete, I find minimal benefit to getting them into therapy much sooner than seven days because I'm doing that you know, just calm that whole injury down with a boot. And, you know, there's good evidence that that uh, the first seven days is really a period of quiescence and stabilizing that ankle. And you got plenty of time after that to get all the benefits of joint mobilization and other things. But again, diametrically opposed to professional athlete, they're working on those guys within hours. Um, uh, we don't all have that uh, accessible, and I'm not so sure it offers that more of an advantage. So uh, I, I would answer your question, Rob, and say seven days. And uh, would that be the same for a juvenile uh, compared to an adult athlete? It's just amazing how quick the juvenile, at least uh, appearance-wise, uh, recover from, uh, you know, they're able to bear weight so much sooner, even after a, a serious ligamentous disruption, you know, grade two, grade three. Um, I, I think the timeline can be pushed up a little sooner on them, but I also think returning them to sport too soon is, is the big thing we're learning now. I mean, we can't, you know, the most frequent ankle sprains, by the way, in this country occur in the age group between age eight and 12. Wow. That's the most frequent age of ankle sprains. And nobody takes them seriously. You know, they tell these kids, oh, get back out there. And you know, the kids can because they're, they're strong and they, they kind of ignore the pain and they're being told to go out and they do it. 
Um, but they, you, you got to watch out for them just as much as taking care of someone our age. You know? um, it, 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 it's a tricky thing that we're still learning a lot about. That's all I can say. Absolutely. Um, I want to switch gears for a second. One of the things I was reading in your book and your prologue, uh, I'm going to quote you. It says, the lateral column of the foot is essential for providing medial transfer of load to the forefoot during terminal stance and pre-swing. Basically, you know, pronation of the forefoot. Uh, we need to, and that's something that we were never taught. I don't think we were taught when we were going through our, our classes. And it's something I think that all, all four of us, all five of us, you know, utilize on a daily basis. Um, how come, you know, we're still seeing a lot of docs not understanding that concept? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, and and uh, that whole prologue kind of explains that is I was educated by, at that time, the greatest biomechanists in the podiatry profession, Root Weed, Orion, Scarlato, um, Ron Valmassi. And while I was in school, uh, in the late 70s, there was a guy named Finn Bojan Moeller who was writing his papers on the function of the foot. And he was an anatomist. And he was never mentioned in podiatry school as a credible source. Yet his papers became this benchmark for a growing insight into the mechanics of the foot that was embraced by everybody but podiatrists. And I, I marvel today how many articles I'll read, for example, in Foot and Ankle International that quote Finn Bojan Moeller. And about 10 years ago, I went back and started reading and that whole concept of lateral column stability is his. And the, the uh, effective pronation of the forefoot and then the push off off the uh, transverse axis engaging the high gear mechanism. All of that that I just said to you was never taught to me, but it's been validated in many studies. And I am convinced it's the proper description of the optimal functioning foot. And it's the theme of that book there that's to your right, Rob, is all of the pathologies that I explore in that book, whether it's digital instability, metatarsalgia, plantar heel pain, and all of the pathologies of the first ray, it's all due to some aberration where the lateral column is not stable and the patient cannot transfer weight medially and engage the transverse axis for a normal push-off and engage the windlass mechanism. So there's a, a brilliant anatomist who gave us insight into the foot function that's every bit as important to me as what I learned from Mert Root and John Weed. And then there's three other anatomists that I mentioned in there as um, McConnell from Ireland back in the 40s, um, a, a fellow named Lewis. And then really a guy who is well-recognized uh, is Serafian who Serafian totally embraced those other anatomists and was able to articulate it better than they were because a lot of them were foreign. They were in other countries. But uh, Serafian, the, the fact that he embraced all that to me validated that. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, you always learn when you start doing these, uh, the research on this. And I didn't know that your, your undergrad, you were a, a zoology major. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. so you, you obviously studied a lot of comparative type of anatomy and things like that. And I know you bring that uh, to highlight in your book quite a bit. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, I started lecturing on comparative anatomy probably 10 years ago, and I was uh, really reinforced by, the, uh, by my peers and saying, wow, that's really helpful to me to see what you're doing. But it also is interesting. It touches the nerve of people because it suggests that we evolved from an ape and that you know, that, uh, you know, there's people who don't believe that Darwin was correct and so forth. And so I tried to st clarify that in the book that anatomy is anatomy. You can't argue anatomy. I I'm not here to say how our foot, e quote, evolved, but I can tell you how specialized our foot is compared to a other primate feet. And the key specialization is the lateral column. It's the elevation of the cuboid off the supportive surface made possible by that unique articulation of the calcaneocuboid joint. You don't find that in any other species, let alone uh, four uh, quadrupleds walking around this planet. And Bojan Moller is the one who showed that. He was a comparative anatomist. Hmm. Bojan Moller was introduced to me through a physical therapist. Uh, actually, his book, I think, is actually dead stock now. You can't get a copy of the anatomy book. 
and she deals with a lot of dancers. And one of the, you know, conditions was cuboid syndrome, you know, cuboid subluxations. And she's like, you know, I have, you know, patients, you know, who come in just strictly for cuboid manipulations and lateral column stability. And, you know, we're talking about auto manipulations, even in the back, you know, area where they're dancing, they have like a, a one and a half quarter inch pipe that they can actually auto manipulate their foot. So the book is amazing. I mean, it's got, you know, muscle you know, relationships and how they're kind of interacting intrinsic muscles and ex extrinsic and uh, looking into obviously the lateral column part we sat through, I think Rob, you may have also, but the spiral dynamics lecture by um, the folks out of Germany that came in uh, to the uh, Midwest conference. I think they also did some work with APSM, but their focus is actually really pronial muscle lateral column stabilization, which mm -hmm. they're controlling first MTP joint, you know, HAV and rotational uh, accesses about that first ray, which I thought was pretty impressive, but it's a long arduous process, like six months of kind of working with a specific therapist on that lateral column stabilization. Well, what's interesting, and Rob had mentioned this when uh, we were going over some topics today about myths and, uh, and uh, some of Ben O'Neig's insight into uh, foot function. And I was groomed that it was all about rear foot alignment and it was rear foot alignment in the frontal plane. It was calcaneal eversion or inversion. And it was, pathologic if it was anything but perpendicular. And then we went through all this research and found out that foot orthotics really weren't making a big difference with calcaneal alignment from a statistical standpoint. And we're going, how is it that these orthotics are working? So, well, we know they work, but we're not seeing these massive changes of rear foot alignment. Well, I think what we're really getting to today is there's a lot more going on in the foot than just the subtalar joint inverting and everting in the frontal plane. And I think the day is going to come when we're going to be able to measure motion and, um, and transfer of load through the midfoot joints from lateral to medial. And, and I think that's the key of what some of these therapies we do. I think that's what it's engaging, yet we just didn't have a way to measure it. Right. I mean, I would love to get Dr. Paul Langer to get involved in this conversation because we've been lucky enough to travel and lecture lots of different places, including the running event in Austin, Texas. And we always saw what's the latest and the greatest as far as shoe gear and how the shoe gears relate to foot orthoses. Um, Paul, what, what do you think? Is there a future for shoes in general to be looking at this lateral column a little bit more as well? Well, it, like Doug said, right now we can't measure a lot of these things, and and we know uh, pretty definitively that humans don't respond in systematic ways to biomechanical interventions. So, being able to assess individual responses to individual inter, uh, interventions, it will get uh, more accessible with some of the things that uh, even just access to pressure mats um, and uh, artificial learning and, and machine learning and data mining, we'll start to understand some of those things better, but we, we do know that there's highly individual responses to a lot of these things. But what I like that that Doug has done well with the book is kind of bring together the, the, the functional anatomy, the comparative anatomy, and even using um, that comparison to the primate foot to help us understand some of these things. And even taking some, you know, previous theoretical papers and then showing how they've been validated, um, what it means for what's going to happen in the future of footwear. We know that we're moving more towards customization, mass customization of footwear. Could shoes be designed that incorporate a, a ideal amount of stiffness and cushioning, as Ben Oneg has uh, talked about? Uh, we're, we're getting closer being able to do that, but there's still a ways to go. But but you do start to, to, when you read this and think about those concepts, um, you start to realize that, okay, may, maybe we're getting closer to knowing enough of how to customize a shoe for an individual athlete or for an individual um, um, sport uh, and that athlete's biomechanics in that sport. Um, so so the, the technology side of, of being able to measure some of those things that Doug's talking about, we're getting closer to it. But as we all know, it's a really complex amount of movement that occurs in the foot in a short amount of time on every single stride. Absolutely. So I, the first time I really got a chance to sit down on a casual basis and, and talk with Dr. Ritchie was in Montreal at a Pofola 
uh, uh, meeting, Buffalo is a prescription foot orthotic lab association meeting. Loved it because we had the opportunity in the classroom to hear these lectures and then sit around over an adult beverage and talk it over. Um, it seems that we're missing some of that. Although I know recently you had um, been to the, I think it's the IFAB meeting, Dr. Ritchie. Right. And it's something that, you know, I don't think enough podiatrists know about. Um, can you explain a little bit what that's all about? Yeah, you know, uh, well, uh, looking back, it, it's funny, Rob, I was, I was looking back and saying, when did I first sit down and talk to Rob? And you're right, it was in Montreal at the Pofola meeting. And uh, kudos to you to take the effort to go to that meeting, because very few podiatrists did, even though they all should have gone. Uh, but the Pofola was <clears throat> an effort by the Prescription Foot Orthotic Lab Association to validate the science of foot orthotic therapy. It was really a, a way to soft market foot orthotics in podiatry and keep the, keep the art forum alive. But it evolved quickly into a very high level research forum about everything to do with foot and ankle and arguably was the finest research foot and ankle meeting in the world. And when it died, and it died because of lack of interest by podiatrists, and um, uh, the only people who were coming to that meeting were PhDs and, and some very interested physical therapists and trainers. And the, lab, the Prescription Foot Orthotic Lab Association said, well, we don't want to spend all this money putting on this meeting. These guys aren't our customers. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it was an economic decision. But those same researchers then formed IFAB, um, <clears throat> International Foot and Ankle Biomechanics uh, uh, symposium, or I forget what, what the acronym is, but uh, that meeting uh, takes place every two years, and it truly is international. It was supposed to be in Sao Paulo, Brazil this year, but it was postponed because of uh, COVID. Uh, uh, it's been in the Far East. Uh, two years ago, it was in New York City, so I went, um, and it was fantastic. Uh, and, and you say, well, and I wrote, and I know why you brought this up, because I wrote a blog about, about it, but, um, and I'm glad at least somebody reads my blog, so I, I appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, the whole day, the first day was on total ankle joint replacement. It was on the biomechanics of, of the arthritic ankle. It was the changes we see kinematically after ankle joint replacement. Michael Coughlin got up and gave the keynote lecture on the development of the STAR implant. I didn't realize what a long, arduous course that was to get FDA approval and all of the testing that was done, a very, very careful data collection and monitoring of these patients over almost a 10 year period. And I looked around the audience and I thought, there's maybe five surgeons in this crowd. I mean, this audience are all PhD biomechanists. You know, where are the, and we're in New York City, where are the podiatrists, you know? This is not a meeting about foot orthotic therapy. This is a meeting about function of the foot that has applicability for sure in the surgical arena. The second day was a whole day put on by hospital for special surgery using, uh, showing all the research they're doing with the curved beam weight bearing CT with flat foot reconstruction. And it was mind blowing what you can see with these curved beam machines and the joint facets in the rear foot and things you can never, we never understood about the adult acquired flat foot. And so the bottom line is these biomechanics meetings have great relevance, even as much as podiatry has changed in the last 30 years, it still should rely heavily on biomechanics. I'm sure Dr. Chin could talk about the curve beam, right? You utilize it in your practice. Uh, in my office. Um... But yeah, the curve beam is, I mean, as a weight bearing CT scan goes, it slices in 0.3 millimeter slices and has, again, the ability to kind of look for those subluxation uh, findings. You know, things that we see obviously, and in, in we're looking at, uh, we just started a fellowship in sports medicine actually in October. And one of my, uh, the first fellow is actually looking at uh, some of the details of uh, again, some data that we can collect from the CT scan, subluxation of cuboid, for example. Uh, anterior subluxation of the talus on the on the ankle. So hopefully put out some good research and some applicable things from an anatomic standpoint. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, 
as we have it in our office, it's really hard to get authorization from the insurance companies to actually, you know, pay for it, which, you know, sometimes is the roadblock, you know, so we end up having, you know, some patients who are cash pay. We get some orthopedists who send their, you know, cases over because they're doing surgical pre-planning, which is, uh, which has been great. So we work with guys like Armin Clickian, who's <laughs> using our system because they can't seem to get one at Northwestern. So uh, it's been a right. great relationship in that sense, but very, very cool stuff going, uh, going with the anatomy part. So just to segue on that, Michael, uh, and that's fantastic. I didn't know you had that there. I might, I'm going to reach out to you with some research ideas sure. uh, that we could perhaps collaborate. So um, my latest blog was on the published study from uh, the Kent State School, okay. the podiatry school on the frontal plane rotation of the sesamoids in Halix valgus. Right. And um, so I wrote the blog about it and I reached out to Paul, uh, no, to um, that group there. And, um, and I said, why didn't you measure the first metatarsal rotation? You know, that's the big key hotbed now for the lapoplasty. And they said, oh, we did. That's the second paper that's under review right now with JFAS. So, um, and then I convinced them, I want to go back and look at that articulation at the first met medial kineiform, which um, the lapoplasty advocate in inverting that as part of the correction. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at some curved beam images and it's always already inverted if you just look at the three dimensional view. Right. So we're gonna, anyway, make a long story short, we're doing a paper together, um, which I'm really happy about, um, where we're gonna measure the rotation of that joint right. in patients with hallux valgus and really show, you really shouldn't be rotating this more into inversion when it's already inverted more than the general population. Yeah, I think, and you know, that was the question I think I you know, posted uh, in our uh, email thread is, you know, how is Cora really affected by, again, in this case, uh, moving to something like a lapoplasty or, you know, some type of lapidus type procedure? Because the sesamoid rotation may be there, 25, 30 degrees of sesamoidal rotation and eversion, but you're proximal, you know, articulation isn't really changed. So you could have a normal articulation at the first mechaniform joint. And all of a sudden now you're derotating that. How, how will that play a role? Yeah. Um, so. And then it, there's this other issue, Michael, and you I know you've seen this, is people are, are speculating that the, the medial kineiform is unstable and is actually adducting towards the midline away from the central kineiform, you know, that there's instability at that inner kineiform joint, which only a curved beam could really uh, detect sure. and validate. I, I think there is some truth to that, but uh, there's so many things we could learn with this. <laughs> yeah, there's every time, uh, Matt, every time Matt coughs, we have to see his face on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Not a COVID cough. Okay. <laughs> now I gotta... Too soon. Um, I'll definitely yeah, love absolutely. to collaborate on that. If uh, if you get a chance, we can you know get offline and you know share some information. But yeah, there's there's yeah. a couple guys who are using that medial uh, column stabilization through the kineiforms by throwing a lag screw across to basically connect the second and uh, first and second kineiform. I think you're, I think you're onto something there. It's almost like Liz Frank's injury, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Destabilization. Matt, do you, can you add to that? Because I know you do quite a bit of that as well. You know, I, I, as far as doing a lot of lapoplasties, I, I can't add, cannot add to that because I've still been a little reluctant um, to do that. And I, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I know um, I'm all for if there's a better way to do something to do it, but I'm just not convinced that I'm not on board with the uh, increase in hardware, increase in OR time uh, for how much better of a result. So maybe it's there, maybe other people are getting it, but I, I just haven't been convinced of it at this point. Yeah. So I think our profession, Doug, and you've probably seen this in your 30 plus years, is where you have like a personality or identity problem. You know, what are we, you know? Are we surgeons, which I see all these young people coming out and they have great hands without question, but do they understand, you know, are they, are they just fixing the what and not the why? 
they understand the why and, and, and how as educators, I know you're an educator now as a professor there, how can we get that to become more of the curriculum? Yeah, that's a tough thing. And I, I, I wrote that, I wrote a whole article about that for Rich Boucher for the uh, upcoming part three history of our academy. And I went back and retraced the curriculum when I was in school. And uh, when I went to CCPM, we had five full semester courses in biomechanics. And one of those courses was sports medicine. Uh, and it truly was a real sports medicine course. It was you know, three days a week with guest lecturers from all over the city of San Francisco. And it wasn't anything uh, really to do with foot orthotic therapy. It was everything else there is in, in sports medicine. And today, the average curriculum at most of the schools around the country is about three courses, and in some cases, two. Because uh, some of the schools don't even have formal courses, like out here in California at Western University, they have this this uh, new progressive curriculum where they blend all these topics together in one module for six weeks. And it's kind of crazy. But the bottom line is, I, I think that our quest to gain parity with, uh, it was, well, I forget what it was called. It was Project 2012, when we were going to convert our curriculum to match allopathic medical schools. And right. the goal was, uh, and, and there was there was good purpose to that. I don't dispute in some ways why we needed to do that. But what we did is we had to cut certain courses and we certainly cut biomechanics in, uh, in lieu of um, <clears throat> epidemiology as a course now, uh, um, uh, uh, psychology as a course now, um, uh, statistics as a full course, which I, I don't argue that because I think we should be doing more research, but public health is a course. And so, we had to, we gave up something that was dear to, to me, was essential to our identity. And you're right, Rob, we had a unique identity in, in the early 80s and 90s. And now we're sort of out there floating, like, uh, you know, we, we did that project and we changed our curriculum. It didn't do anything. I mean, out here in California, we're still really battling to try to get physician and surgeon status with our state licensure and we keep pointing to our curriculum. Like, look at our curriculum. We, we have the identical curriculum to allopathic medical schools. Doesn't seem to make a difference. So um, I, I, I think it was, uh, I think it backfired. And I, I do think a lot of our identity has been lost. And, and as a lecturer at the schools of podiatric medicine, uh, there's no formal courses in sports medicine. Uh, it, it's you guys with the academy going out and doing these brief but very important uh, focused seminars but uh, unfortunately it's just once a year and it, it's not enough yeah I'll, I'll be honest with you i have a frustration in the fact that the four of us are very passionate about doing what we're doing right here right now um is bringing information to the, the public as well as to the students and we know that there's there's people who have never heard of rpm squared you know and and, and, the, and the lecturers that we bring here so I don't know if they don't know about it or they don't care about it. You know, it's just something that's not in their wheelhouse and just not that interesting to them. So it's, it's frustrating. I mean, Paul, do you feel that same way? You know, sometimes we, we put our time into this and. Yeah, I do. And, and, and you were touching on a question I wanted to ask Doug too. It's tied into that. It's like, I, I think about the future of podiatry and, and what I see like in my area is there aren't a lot of people that understand foot and ankle function from a biomechanical perspective. And it's so important and so much of what we see in uh, sports medicine is non-operative and it needs a good understanding of the, the pathomechanics, the biomechanics. Um, and I do feel like we're losing that. And, and even to the extent where when I talk to orthotic labs, most of them tell me that a lot of their podiatrists want them to write the prescriptions for them. <laughs> so we, we've been outsourcing something that, that I think podiatry and, and Doug, you know, the guys that were at the forefront of this and you trained with them, that uh, this niche, this specialty that, that we kind of developed, our forefathers developed for us and, and hopefully we carry the torch forward. But I see it slipping away and, and I don't know how you reverse that course because I think some people that are trying to specialize in it aren't doing it as well or don't have the foundation that a lot of us have. Um, so so I, I have great concern for that. I think it's a great specialty that's that's kind of uh, kind of withering away, so to speak. 
I can I kind okay. of a, a point, you know, and in, in education wise at the school at Chicago school, they have five classes on sports medicine. That's it. It's part of their biomechanics rotation. I think, you know, to the point of educating kind of beyond the college setting and beyond maybe the, you know, because I think people are still trying to figure themselves out in residency is the fellowship route. And that's one of the reasons why we did that. You know, is that people who have that interest and in wanting to do something of a specialty niche, I think really has to then kind of look beyond that residency. They, they're getting cases and, you know, their logs kind of set up to try and then practice, but people are starting to kind of look for that secondary piece and hopefully, you know, opening up something like a fellowship uh, offers that opportunity. So sorry to interrupt, but. So, um, um, what I'm, uh, I might write in my next blog is, um, I don't know if you're aware, but the Council on Podiatric Medical Education is changing, reviewing the uh, requirements and the guidelines for certification of, of residency training. And one of the proposed changes is to reduce the number of required biomechanical exams from 75 cases to 50 cases. And I've always said, why is it always, why was it ever limited to 75? I mean, I really think every patient should have at least some rudimentary biomechanical workup before every, every surgery. And theoretically, these residencies are requiring the residents to do a preoperative workup. Uh, why isn't it including biomechanics? Right. And now they're going to cut it down to 50 cases. And the, the question is, well, if, if you're cutting it down, you must be replacing it with some other requirement. What is it? You know, and I know the wound care people are fighting to get their niche. You know, they want to get a requirement for so many wound care cases or whatever. But uh, having just written that book, I, I, I have a proposal. And that is, if I was running a residency program, and I, told, I would tell every one of my residents, you don't scrub a case. You don't scrub a case unless you're able to tell the attending before that surgery what you've learned from that patient and what risk factors you've identified that cause that pathology you're about to operate on. Smart. You should be able to tell me one intrinsic and one extrinsic risk factor that you identified in that patient that caused their bunion or caused their uh, plantar plate tear or their perineal tendon tear, whatever. If you can't tell me how I got there, you're not going in the operating room and trying to fix it, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we so we, we, uh, I don't like the trend. That's all I'll say. Yeah, you know, it's amazing because, you know, all five of us have had a very long and, and productive and perhaps lucrative careers from doing sports medicine, you know. Um, and it's, it just boggles my mind that younger physicians and clinicians are not drawn to it. And I think part of it is to understand that, you know, obviously, Sports podiatry is not just orthotics and in, in, in deals with, you know, the things we just talked about, plus things we're not even talking about, like dermatology. Um, and that's part of it, too. It's always an intrinsic reason why we're getting these issues. We have to have, see what's going on, um, you know, and then even looking more into the, the retail space and, you know, how that affects us and affects our outcomes. You know, I think there's so much more. If we really want to be good clinicians, a good podiatrist, we have to bring all of that together, you know, and we don't have to, be, we have to be great surgeons, but we have to understand the concepts behind it and maybe give it to a better technician. But, you know, I think we have to work together better. Amen. Yeah. So on, on, that, on that note, um, I thank you, Doug, for being here and giving us insight. And um, if the uh, gentleman had any other questions or concerns, you can, as long as we have Doug here. It, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment, um, Doug, with your book, and, and I got it last week and I've, I've been starting to read it. What I'm excited about that you do so well is you, you take this complex topic and, and instead of us, the way we all learned was we learned a book on anatomy, a book, a book on biomechanics, a book on injuries and pathologies, but I haven't seen it synthesized this well. Um, in, in any single source. And I like that you focused on the main pathologies that most of us see with foot and ankle. So, so I, I'm really excited to work my way through this and, and already just some of the insights that you offer in the first couple chapters have been really good to kind of refresh what I 
have learned, but also update me on some things that that you have. And, and plenty of times when I read books like this, I'm not only thinking about how I help my patient, but I also how I help my patient understand their condition. And, and I think you, you touch on all those elements. So, so I think this is a, a great work that's really important to our profession. I appreciate all the work you put into it. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that. Well, you know, I started out, I was going to write a book on biomechanics. I was going to write the new version of Mert Root's book, Normal and Abnormal Function of the Foot. And, um, uh, about that time I was going to write the book, I was contacted by the Podiatry Institute and they were uh, developing the, uh, the new updated version of McGlamory surgery, the foot and ankle. And for the first time, they wanted an introductory chapter on biomechanics and they wanted me to write it, which was a real honor for me. And I said, you want me to write a chapter on biomechanics? I mean, that's like writing a chapter on cardiology for an internal medicine book. It's like, it's too broad of a topic. And they said, pick whatever you want to talk about. And so I sat down and said, what would a surgeon want to know as succinctly as possible to better understand the mechanics of the foot so that everything else in this book makes sense to them? And I sat down and I said, well, I think they should go back and understand the gait cycle and muscle function and how the bones move. And as I went through it and started thinking of the pathologies that were related to it, I almost, I, at that point I said, you know, I really wanna take this a step farther and write a whole book about it. And that's what happened. I wanna take the mechanics and relate it to the pathologies. And that's why the book is called Pathomechanics yeah, to make, make it relevant to everyday clinical practice. And hopefully that's what I did. Yeah, yeah, you definitely did very well. Yeah. And just a comment, a quick little uh, getting your thought, Doug. Uh, I was fortunate to do a lot of stuff with ACSM, and um, this is probably 20 years ago now. Irene Davis at one of the meetings at a lecture on ankle sprains, and her lecture turned out to be on core stability and the effect of your core on the likelihood of having, having an ankle sprain. I know there's been several. Uh, articles that I think you've refer referenced over the years as well on the uh, on the importance of not just looking at the ankle rehab, but uh, having a stronger core makes it less likely that you're going to sprain your ankle. And I assume that's still probably your thought on that. Um, yeah, but, you know that that's a real hot area now in in quote bio foot and ankle biomechanics is looking at uh, the energy storage mechanism of the foot and the role of muscle activation. And uh, Irene joined up with a guy who I was just a huge fan of named Patrick McKeon, who we actually had come to Atlanta to the very last Pofola conference. Uh, Patrick was a PhD student under Jay Hertel, who's like the big guy in ankle sprains. And he was one of the early guys to, to really look at this foot core and arch strengthening and look, look at muscular function and energy storage. Uh, and Irene teamed up with them and they published that just fantastic article called the foot core mechanism. And I show a bunch of pictures from that article in my book because it has relevance, not just to the ankle sprain, it has relevance to um, uh, every, to plantar heel pain, to metatarsalgia. And so, um, it's really interesting what we're learning now, because now we can do EMG studies in the foot. You know, we, we can do quantitative measurement of EMG. And the guy doing a lot of that work is a guy named Luke Kelly, who's in Queensland, Australia. And a, a guy I've had a couple of Zoom calls with, a uh, really great guy. And the stuff they're doing in Australia on just the foot core and the energy mechanisms of the human foot is really exciting. It's gonna have a lot of relevance to everything we do uh, shortly. And by the way, these are podiatrists doing this research, but they've all gone on and gotten their PhD, but they're podiatrists and some of them are working in a clinic three days a week, you know, doing foot orthotic therapy. And then they're in a gate lab doing EMG studies. It's, it's phenomenal. Right, and uh, one more just quick thought, if you, if you can on uh, athletic uh, footwear with the carbon plates with it seems like every uh, shoe company is coming out with their own version of some type of shoe that's going to pivot or assist uh, using a carbon plate to propel forward. Do you have any, any thoughts on that or any comments? 
on where that's going or is it a, a trend or fad or legitimate? Yeah, and then, uh, well, it, it, it all makes perfect sense because it's really what Boja Moeller was saying in the late seventies. It's like, you know, he envisioned this energy storage mechanism and then this recoil, you know, during the push off phase, you know, across the transverse axis. And I think with the carbon fiber plate is definitely a, a synthetic aid to that. And so the, there's a lot of ethical questions in, you know, performance enhancement with this, uh, you know, I remember I was a swimmer growing up and I still follow the sport heavily. And for a while we were watching these body suits being allowed in the pool and world records being broken by, you know, four seconds in a, you know, a, a 200 meter freestyle. And happily the Federation got together and said, enough is enough. This is an external artificial aid to performance. And, um, you know, we, we look at footwear kind of silly, like there's no way that's making that guy run faster. Well, it is. It's pretty clear it is. And uh, I think that we've got to step back and evaluate it and decide, you know, maybe we should strengthen their foot core and take away the carbon fiber plate and, and let the best athlete actually win this race. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Rob Gilbert is, is uh, one of our... Uh, initial individuals who we interviewed, he is a sports psychologist. And, you know, he always says that, you know, you can read all you want to read, but you really got to have a mentor. And you have been a mentor to me and to everyone on this call. And we thank you for all of you help to make us better clinicians. So uh, I really appreciate your time today, Doug. It was really meaningful to me. And I know the whole crew feels the same way. Thank you. Doug. Well, it's my pleasure. And let me just say, I am so proud of all of you, of what you've done and what I know you're going to continue to do to advance uh, this cause of podiatric sports medicine and to keep our profession great. You, know, you guys are all, you're all heroes of mine. So it was an honor to be part of this call.